Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and HBO's The Last of Us explores the horrifying hypothetical of a cordyceps fungal infection overtaking humanity. Episode 2 of this series introduces a new element to the fungus that isn't present in the games. They're connected. More than you know. The fungus also grows underground. Long fibers like wires, some of them stretching over a mile. You step on a patch of cordyceps in one place, and you can wake a dozen infected from somewhere else. This line sets up the final scene of the episode in which Joel shoots an infected runner and mycelia snake out of the soil around the host's fingers and then that same patch of the fungus alerts a horde of nearby infected. Now again, this is not the case in the games, in which the primary range threat of the fungus is airborne spores, but the producers confirm spores will not be part of the series in season one. This is all inspired by real world mycology, that's the study of fungi, and in fact the largest organism on planet earth is a single fungus in eastern Oregon sprawling four square miles or ten square kilometers estimated to be at least 2400 years old. But with the show, when many of you ask me follow-up questions like how does the fungus control remote runners and clickers that it's not attached to in that moment? Is it telepathic? Is it pheromone based? Or does this mean the fungus has a hive mind or a memory or a soul or intelligence? Also, is it capable of love and can I marry it because I want to be kissed like that? I quickly realized that I was out of my depth, but I began this year promising that we would be doing more expert breakdowns on New Rockstars, so here's our first one of 2023. So we're going to break down how cordyceps really works, separate fact from science fiction with an actual expert. Please welcome to the channel mycologist for the New York Botanical Garden who studies the systematics and evolution of cordyceps fungi, a real cordyceps expert, Dr. Joao Araujo. All right. Thank you, Eric, for the invitation. It would be a pleasure to talk about cordyceps with you. So tell us about what kind of work you do. So my work is I'm a scientist and I'm based at the New York Botanical Garden where I'm a researcher in curator in mycology and I, I have been working and studying cordyceps diversity and evolution since 2010 so it has been 13 years dedicated in this fungi i have done all my phd and masters and postdocs on, on the subject and my work has basically described new species of cordyceps so i travel ac across the world in south america mostly brazilian amazon africa asia and collecting these insects uh, that are manipulated and it has this cordyceps uh, fruity body coming out from their body. And then I bring them to the lab, do microscopy work and then DNA work that we compare with other species to decide if they are new species or not. So that's the, the foundation of my work. Wow, uh, you have such an interesting job. And now more relevant, <laughs> I think, to people who, who watch a ton of TV than ever, I would say, uh, which has got to be very exciting for you. Yeah, it's really amazing to see something that I have dedicated like so many years of my life being a pop culture now and everybody's talking about that and especially in the second episode I was watching and they were searching for a mycologist and <laughs> oh that's my job identifying <laughs> off your cordyceps on the microscope so that's what I do on a daily basis this would be you who's um who's kidnapped by government agents to go out to the exactly <laughs> Yeah, that was really, really amazing to see that on, on the TV. And we had mentioned before we started recording that uh, you've also played The Last of Us games. On, I did, um, yeah. So you're very aware of this whole uh, world. Um, now, the so The Last of Us game, as you know, uses a mutated strain of the cordyceps fungus, which the game developer Neil Druckmann, based on a Planet Earth documentary that showed how the fungus works in ants, uh, the HBO series producers even considered opening with this clip for the series before they instead wrote this 1968 talk show scene in which a scientist describes fungi like cordyceps and how they can affect our brain chemistry. And um, they say while the fungi cannot survive in body temperatures over 94 degrees Fahrenheit, the scientist goes on saying, what if, for instance, since the world were to slightly get warmer, um, saying that there's a reason to evolve, the gene mutate, and um, the fungus could become capable of burrowing into our brains and taking control of millions of us, billions of us, billions of puppets with poisoned minds, mm. permanently fixed on one unifying goal to spread the infection to every last human alive by any means necessary, and there are no treatments for this. I have to start here. How plausible is this scenario in real life? No, that's very unlikely, because cordyceps have been evolving with... Uh, their whole insect host for over a uh, hundred million years ago. So they have been developing all this ability to infect the insect and overcome the immune system, establish inside the insect and, and fulfill the insects with fungal hyphae and all that stuff, but preserving the, in the, the insect brain so it can still uh, manipulate it somehow because if destroy the brain, 
would be destroyed. So there's no movement anymore. So the insect would be completely useless for the fungus. And so it has been evolving for millions of years. And then they're very specific to insects. So especially the Ophiocordyceps that manipulate the, the, the ant behavior, make their zombies, they're very specific. So one species of Ophiocordyceps will infect one species of ant. So they're really specific, not only insects, but ants, but not only ants, but ant species. So the level of speciation is really, really high. So in order to jump from a, 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 a infecting an ant and then becoming a, a mammal, a human parasite, there would be required so many genetic changes and the ability to overcome the human uh, um, the human immune system, which is completely different from the, from the insect in, in, in many ways. So there w- would be so many changes required that would be taken millions and millions of years for these changes to take place, I, I believe. So I think it's pretty just uh, scientific f- fiction for, for, for the series. That's pretty comforting to mm-hmm. hear. <laughs> Thank you for, for uh, evading those fears. Yeah, but other, other um, fungi but... also infect humans and has causing uh, lots of oh, deaths. God. Yeah, but they're not able to infect the brain. You know, we could have ended it there. <laughs> you had to scare us again. Yeah. yeah, but most fungi are beneficial to the to the humanity and for the ecosystems. So even the parasites. So they're they're bad for one individual ant. But when we talk about ants, we're talking about just, not just one individual, but are super organisms that, that are composed by millions of mm. uh, individual units. But they act as one individual super organism as the whole colony. Wow. Okay, um, yeah, because I have right. some questions right. about specifically how mm-hmm. that works too. But, but first, I just, I also, this may seem like a dumb question, but when the cordyceps infects insects like ants, um, do those insects aggressively attack each other the way science fiction zombies do or the way the infected humans do in this show? Well, actually, what we have seen in the lab, uh, the lab I used to work with in, when I was a PhD student, I, I, I was in charge of uh, working on the cordyceps diversity and evolution. Other colleagues were doing uh, artificial infections of cordyceps in the ants to observe them in the lab. So how they, how they would react to, to the injection of uh, uh, cordyceps on them. And then they found out, uh, uh, Professor David Hughes in, in, at Penn State so was my PhD advisor, and they, they, they figured out that they take about two weeks to develop and then to cause manipulation under laboratory conditions. So our estimation is that it takes about two weeks to, for since the infection to the manipulation stage. And once the, the ant is infected, so the fungus will develop inside the, the, the ant body as a yeast-like cells. So there are single cells, like global cells, spheres floating out in, inside the, the insect. And as the disease progresses, all these cells will multiply and completely fill the, the insect body. And after the insect is killed, so the, the, after the transition, and then they become filamentous fungi that will then organize themselves to create those fruiting bodies that will shoot spores. So that's how they develop. But uh, answering your question, so they don't become uh, aggressive, but they, they will abandon their colony to seek for an optimal location for the fungus to develop. So it is an altruistic insect that abandoned mm-hmm. the nest to do to act in favor of the fungal fitness. So it's acting for the fungus. That's why we call it zombie ants. I see. So it's not so much that they're attacking each other. They're just a bit yeah. clingy. Like, hey, guys, yeah, I don't exactly. understand yeah. personal space. And then they, they have you to know? leave the colony because <laughs> if the, the, the fungus, the, that infected ant was detected by the other colony members that has something called social immunity. So the, all the other colony members would attack that infected one to stop the, the spread of the disease. So what the fungi, or cordyceps specifically, of your cordyceps, developed in this ability to manipulate was to remove the ant from the, 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 the nest before the other lab mates recognize it as infected and kill it. So the, the cordyceps could not develop and complete the life cycle. So the strategy for the social immunity and these defensive mechanisms inside the ant colony was to remove the ant from the nest and then place them in a location that's ideal for the fungi to grow. This was a, a brilliant mechanism that the evolution 
uh, shape. So I think it's pretty amazing how they do that. Yeah, you brought, brought up something really interesting with the fact that um, that cordyceps has evolved with this species of ants for you know millions and millions of years. It seems like ants have even adapted a, a behavioral response to deal with it, which is encouraging as well, that every, every species finds a way to deal with their problems. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, but uh, as I said, the cordyceps, the offshore cordyceps, they infect the, uh, a few members of the colony, even when we find uh, many infected uh, ants in the same tree sometimes in, in, in the dozens, like 30 ants in a single tree hanging on the leaves with mushrooms coming out from their body. It's pretty pretty amazing to see that. It's like Christmas tree, but instead of balls hanging, there are ants with mushrooms. And yeah. they're beautiful. Well, I, I only yes, can see the, the beauty <laughs> on, on, that, on that stuff. So I see that it has some horror uh, side of which the story, great. the dramatic yeah. zombification of stuff, which makes it cool and easier to to spread the word with the broader, broader public other than, than scientists and academics. So I think this is a pretty amazing system to communicate science through, through these stories. I agree. Um, getting back to the show, we, we learned early on in this HBO series that fungus is spread through, we think, the food supply, specifically a flour mill in Jakarta, Indonesia, They uh, and they call it a perfect substrate. Can you explain what a substrate is and whether flour would be a good substrate to, to spread a fungus like this on a mass scale? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, the cordyceps, they're pretty specific to, to insects. And now we're finding out that they are also present in inside plants as endophytes. But to spread to the next holes, they have to produce the, the, the fruiting body and shoot the spores. And then it lands into a suitable host that the spore will germinate, penetrate the cuticle, which is like the, 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 the insect skin analogous. And then they penetrate and then they, they infect the whole insect. So I, I don't think the, the flower would be, would be too dry to start with because fungi requires uh, humid. But perhaps mm. they, they said it was the perfect media for the fungi to grow because sometimes we, go, we grow fungi on petri dishes, on agar, so which is mm. it's like flower. It's very nutritionally rich like flowers are. But flower is completely dry, so it would need some humidity for the fungi to thrive and start to decompose that organic matter. Yeah, so, but they are very specific to insects and flower wouldn't be the, the perfect place for them to, to grow. Yeah, I think it would be more of a worst case scenario substrate. Mm-hmm. Like if it were to, like in some kind of sci-fi scenario, it could just be as flower is just so widespread across the world. Yeah, and it's dry. So fungi requires humidity to, to germinate spores, to establish in the, in the substrate and do their, their fungal stuff. So they need humidity. Now, a grim solution gets proposed on the show uh, enacted to control the spread of these infections. Bomb. Start bombing. And then later we see a bomb crater in the city of Boston. And they say that, you know, it, it worked in Boston, um, but it didn't work in most other cities. Why would bombing or fire be a way to stop a fungus like this? Would could that risk spreading more spores in the real world? Well, it, it wouldn't be anyhow, just like throwing a bomb and destroying a whole city is already something we, we, we should not even discuss uh, in, in any context, even in a fungal apocalypse, so to start with. Yeah. And, but, uh, well, I, I think because fungi are, are difficult to treat when the fungal infections and, and stuff, and so I think it's, it's pretty hard if that scenario was real, so these fungi is spreading to others and to others, and that, that would be crazy. But for cordyceps, they would require to kill the host first. So the human would have to ne- need to be killed by the cordyceps. And then days later, the, the fruiting body would come up and then shoot spores to spread. So that would be enough time to see someone that was dead, but not with the fruiting body. So we, before the fruiting body is formed, it cannot be transmitted well, cordyceps in the real life, but who knows in the in the, in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it yeah. sounds like it, this is just kind of a drastic last last resort. Um, yeah. Uh, but I am so glad you answered Please the question as you people. did. Like, if yeah. we ever do no, have a scenario that's not where the solution an infection, in any case, we never. should never jump to bomb. <laughs> yeah, that's insane. So also, as you know from playing the game, airborne spores are a threat. You have to wear uh, an oxygen mask. Mm-hmm. Uh, the HBO mm-hmm. show comes up with a new form of a range threat, the, the soil itself, which can contain what they say are these fibers that extend for miles beneath the ground and alert other patches of the fungus. Mm-hmm. And the character Tess explains this. And we see rows of infections 
infected people on the ground reacting to sunlight. They all kind of roll over in a wave pattern. Can uh, you offer any insights on what might be going on here? Yeah, well, uh, that was fictional, completely fictional. I think they wanted to convey the idea of uh, colony so that they would act collectively against environmental conditions or in response to environmental conditions. But, well, in, in cordyceps, of your cordyceps that, in fact, ends and change the behavior, so a true zombie fungus. So in one example in Brazilian Amazon, the species called Ophiocordyceps nifofioides. So these species, the asexual stage, when they, they infect the ants, they manipulate them to go to the tree. And when the, the, the ant is dead, it's, it's, it's killed by the fungus to the tree. So this fungi, rather than only producing the fruiting body, they produce like structures that look like uh, roots and they grow underneath the, the moss where these ants are attached. So they grow underneath the, this uh, moss carpet, and then they roots uh, a little bit wider than, than the ends, like a radius, like, like this high. And then when the other workers come to see that that ant is also infected by a cordyceps, then they, they will remove it from the tree to avoid infection. But what those structures that are growing underneath the moss, what they do is to keep the cordyceps there. And eventually they can grow a small uh, asexual structure that will produce spores. And even though the host was removed, those uh, uh, filaments that are rooted underneath the moss are producing spores. So there, there is a few examples where they can produce similar uh, structures like that and, and, mm. and, and creep through the, 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 the substrate. But I, I'm... I, I don't know any uh, example of uh, in different individuals are communicating and uh, transporting nutrients in, among each other, but it can be possible. Are fungi known for having um, responses to light or temperature increases or decreases? Yes, there is a very interesting fungus. It's very decently related to cordyceps called pilobolus. So it actually mm -hmm. grows on, on dung, cow dung. And when they grow their, their fruiting body, they're really beautiful translucent uh, structures. And then they have a global head with a dark, like a little head. And then they, they point it towards the light as just because they need to shoot to the open air. So they, 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 they aim towards the light to have the spore shot. And then when they mature, they create such a strong pressure. And then these uh, sporangium will be shot in very, very high um, uh, speed. I, I, if I'm not wrong, this is, was uh, ranked the, the 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 fastest organism on Earth. The speed this sporangium uh, reaches is super high, like a shotgun. So it's faster than wow. most things in the wild. Wow. Um, yeah. And speaking yeah. of the speed of, uh, of the version of cordyceps in the show, you know, these infected runners get activated and they take off running and they seem to know where to go. Uh, and so I want to ask you, in nature, in real life, can uh, cordyceps stay communicated with pieces of itself once those pieces are no longer physically connected? Like, do pieces of fungi or spores have possibly a memory? Can they be directed by things like pheromones? What do you think? No, 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 they, they, no, no, absolutely not. But the, the pheromones, we, we know very little about that. But in, in some species, there are some uh, studies showing that the the manipulation in a different group of fungi, the Entomophthora mycota, which is a very strange name. So it's a decently related to cordyceps, but some species also have the behavior manipulation thing. And there was was shown that they they when they 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 kill the host and they, they start producing the fruiting body, they also release uh, pheromones that will mimic pheromone of insects to attract other uninfected wow. insects. And when they touch these infected insects, they get infected as well because they try to mate with a dead uh, insect covered with fungal spores. So they, that's how they are transmitted. So there's some interesting strategies. Right, that them. is very interesting. And like when, you know, human audiences, human audiences, you know, when, when people watch these, <laughs> uh, watch these science fiction shows, I think we often will project our own kind of behavior onto inanimate things like that's just human nature to see personalities and souls and and faces and things that may not be there it's just a natural evolution at work um and this moment i don't know about you when i watched it i was like my mind just jumps to oh it's hive mind it's avatar there's cognition among uh, among these um uh among this fungus um 
And uh, talking with our, our uh, behind the scenes guy, Berg, he's really interested in these subjects of what constitutes cognition, uh, a mind, intelligence. Um, I, this is, might be a dumb question, but do fungi think? Well, they, they, they can collectively react uh, to environmental conditions and biotic and abiotic uh, conditions for sure. So I, I think that's a way of reacting in a smart way against or in reaction to something else. So I think this is a type of intelligence. And if we think of evolutionarily, the, we think about, as, as you say, we, we used to anthropo, anthropomorphize, anthropomorphize, I forgot the word. But so it, we try to bring it to the analogous to, to the humans. So like, uh, especially about evolutionary processes, we, we tend to think, oh, the, the cordyceps, they just decided to remove the ant from the nest. So they, they don't make decisions. They don't decide. So this is a result of millions and millions of years of, of evolution and experimenting. So nature experiments a lot. So one lineage eventually produced a metabolite that was able to hijack the ant's brain. And this lineage was successful. And then this lineage is still thrives in the forest. And then they speciate into many other species like cordyceps. There are hundreds, uh, thousands of species of cordyceps. And the ones that has the ability to manipulate the host behavior are over 35 species, but our uh, uh, our estimates uh, range from over 600 to up to uh, a thousand species. So there are lots of different species just waiting to be uh, described. Yeah, uh, that's. I mean, again, just the the real the reality of it. The real scientific truth is just far more interesting than I think what my imagination jumps to. This got me thinking. You know, human beings, we have our own kind of self-centered way of looking at this. We think, we have a mind, we have a soul, we have a personality and identity and memories. Uh, is there any kind of like collective memory that can exist among uh, fungus colonies that uh, mm -hmm. that is, I don't know, we might be out of our depth here, but might be more advanced than the way human beings work individually? Well, yeah. Oh, not exactly in fungus, but in slime molds, which which were traditionally in the past considered within the fungus, the slime molds, especially those uh, uh, yellow uh, thing, the the dictyospora and, and, and this type of, of, of slime mold. So they, there are some studies really, really interesting showing that they have some type of memory. They can solve puzzles in order to get food, for example, and to get this nutritional a uh, stimulant that they give them. So they act collectively in order to drive that, that slime mold, the uh, shape, amoeba shape into this uh, food source. And which I, I think is, is, is pretty, pretty amazing for uh, yeah. unicellular organisms that they, they act uh, uh, collectively. And, and when they are producing their fruiting body, their uh, uh, reproductive structures, they form those stalks to elevate those structures, the sporangium, and those stalks are composed by, by, by cells that committed suicide in order to uh, make that, that uh, stipe really rigid and able to erect that structure in order to shoot spores more effectively. So it's pretty an altruistic, wow. uh, altruistic yeah. each particular cell, each particular nuclei will act collectively, but at the same time they will perform also individual tasks like suiciding in order to elevate the the, the, the spore producing structure. So there's so many cool stories wow. to be to be told and we know so little about especially cordyceps. So there's uh, very few people studying their diversity and their evolution in the world because they're they are globally distributed and way more people should be studying them than trying to tell these stories because there's so much more stuff we don't know just sitting in the forest waiting for us to go there and tell the story. So when you play a game like Last of Us or watch the HBO adaptation, uh, as a scientist who is an expert in this stuff, do you enjoy it? Um, is it this? Uh, do you think it's performing a public good to um, shine a spotlight on this area of science? Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's, it's pretty... Uh, some, some of, A few colleagues, I, I see them commenting on like in a picky way, how to, oh, this is not scientifically accurate. They should do this way or that way. So, but just the fact we are sitting here discussing cordyceps in, in your channel that is, has super high uh, audience, a lot of people uh, pay attention to that. And National Geographic, BBC, Forbes Magazine, and all these places are discussing that in the last week. So 
just by discussing cordyceps and the importance and then that there is a fungus that hijacks the host brains and produce those fruiting body and they are extremely photogenic. So it, it, it's easy for us to spread the word about this fungi. But this is really amazing that a series is taking this to another level and communicating to millions and millions of people. So I think this is just a fascinating way to communicate and link the scientific work with the science fiction, the society, and then the broad public. I think this is amazing. It should have be done more. And you know, um, at, you know, as we mentioned earlier, there is a beauty. There is a natural beauty in the way that um, that these uh, fungi mm-hmm. bloom and spread outward and, and form these stalks. And, you know, in the show, it's a form of environmental terror. But, like, in another way, the fact that we have to live with them so much, it kind of just creates, like... It's differently beautiful world. Yeah, and there's sense. such a, a tiny structure. It's like the searching for a, a needle in a haystack in the forest. Because imagine an Amazon rainforest. So it's really complex, dense, and lots of things growing. So and they occupy very specific niches in the forest, like underside of rocks or inside tree trunks or underside of leaves. So you have to know what you're looking for. But once you calibrate your eyes, you can find lots of them everywhere. And, but they are small. Once they, we bring them to the lab, or even when we take photos with their macro camera, as, as I, I show you the, some of my photos, and then they reveal to be much more beautiful because they, then we see their details and their shapes and their colors. So I think this is a really interesting uh, um, group of organisms to make this bridge between science communication and sci-fi and the actual hardcore science, uh, scientific work. But I think this is this is great. Joao, thank you so much for breaking down the science right, behind Elastos for us. It was so great to be able to talk to a real-life cordyceps expert working at the New York Botanical right, Garden. Thank you. thank you so much. So New Rockstars is covering The Last of Us with in-depth episode breakdowns and after shows. Subscribe to New Rockstars and subscribe to our new channel, The Deep Dive, launching February 17th. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at EA Voss. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.